This is a Defocus Media production. Defocus Media, optometry's number one podcast, welcomes you to Eye Care Shenanigans, where doctors Jeff Fardink and Daryl Glover discuss the latest in eye care trends, news, research, and more. Hello there. Welcome, everybody. Dr. Jeff Fardink here with my friend, my colleague, my brother from another mother, Dr. Daryl Glover. We are here to bring you some of the latest and greatest news, trends, articles coming from the world of eye care. Dr. Glover, how are you this fine morning? Man, I am doing extremely well and super excited because I get to see your handsome face again. You know, I've been That's missing right. you, my friend. I miss, you. I miss you every day. See that handsome face? I'm ready. Ready to go. Awesome, man. How's practice been? How's the family been? Family's been great. Practice has been great. Very busy, busy time of year. Everyone's coming in for the new year. Get their uh, got their benefits reset. It's been it's been rolling. How's your family doing? My my family's doing well, man. My little girl is now two and a half. My son is almost seven. I'm just like time is flying, man. It it's does. blowing my mind, right? Yeah, the day, days are long, years are short, man. My five year old's getting older every day. It's crazy. We're reading we're reading Lord of the Rings together. <laughs> oh, nice, very nice. Well, yeah. you know, we're, we're talking about you know kids and. You know, we're going to bring in some amazing topics. And the first topic is very interesting. And we're going to label this Every Diopter Matters because it truly does, right? Mm -hmm. What is this all about? So just another great recap of the importance of myopia management, myopia control. This was a uh, talk given by a professor in a, a recent study in Puerto Rico. Let me see here. Basically just highlighting how the importance of um, myopia control and the... Uh, the issues that arise with it. So Dr. Cassie Ludwig out of the uh, professor of ophthalmology from Stanford talking about regimatogenous retinal detachment, myopic macular degeneration, and myopic traction maculopathy. These are some of the main risks that develop as uh, myopia increases. And she's just reminding us that every diopter counts, every diopter matters. The more myopic someone gets, the more likely these conditions are to form and the more important it is to you know, remind our patients of the importance of myopia control. She's also highlighting the importance of monitoring our highly myopic patients and, uh, and treating these conditions as they develop. There is some, some good news here with the high myopia, um, myopic muscular neovascularization that of course happens in, uh, as these uh, eyes are elongating. It appears to be much more responsive to anti-VEGF treatments than just standard macular degeneration is. So as long as you're catching these things and treating it, it uh, they can respond well to treatment. But the most important thing, prevention. Prevention is better than, than treatment. If we can prevent these eyes from getting nearsighted in the first place, we're less likely to see these complications develop in the, at all. So just a reminder of that. And, and I think we need that constant reminder, right? We got to remember when a, a, a child comes into our chair and we see any signs of myopia, we can't sit on that. We have to do something about it, right? Just think mm -hmm. about the complications long term. You can make a change in that kid's life. You can make a change in that family's life. So do the right thing. Even if you don't want to do anything with myopia control, pass it to another optometrist that may specialize in it, but just make the connection, make the magic happen. Do not sit on that. And again, thank you so much for that fr uh, friendly reminder because we definitely yeah. need that. It makes me think of a patient I've got in my, my clinic, a long-term patient of mine. He's 60 years old. He's about a minus 22 in both eyes. Wow. Yeah. He, he corrects to a good 20, 30 in either eye with a, with a biofinity uh, extended range uh, sphere lens there. Wow. And, uh, you know, he's, he's come up on needing cataract surgery and cataract surgery from a refractive standpoint will be great for him because yeah. getting that, that lens in there, he's going to, you know, have that correction closer to the retina. He's going to have better optics, but the risk of retinal detachment here with cataract surgery is huge for an eye like this. That's a great so, call out. Great call yeah, out. So just, um, I, um, I love how you bring these real life scenarios of what you see in the clinic and align it with the articles, right? Because this is things that uh, or topics and conversation and dialogue that our doctors that are listening can bring back to their practice. So Absolutely. yeah, all my colleagues out there, do not let that kid go um, untreated for myopia control. And then also make sure you properly educate about the complications, but also consider when you have these patients that are at that age of having cataract surgery, if they're minus 22, you need to let them know something might cook up during that procedure. So it's always key to properly educate your patients. And you get that when you listen to eye care shenanigans, baby. That's right. As after I saw him, I texted a good ophthalmologist friend of mine. I was saying, you know, what do you think about this guy? Should we be, should we be a proactive and do the cataract surgery early? Should be, should be waiting until they really need yeah. to do it. And you know, I love this guy, Dr. Andy Michael here in Richmond just said, you know, just, let's just do it when he needs it. You know, let's gotcha. just not be early. Let's not be late. Let's just do it when he needs it and see what happens. So I'm like, all right, we'll, we'll get there. I love it. I love it. Well, next cooking up, we have long-term shortening. And I know everyone's listening to this and they're saying, what does that mean? That doesn't even make sense. Well, Dr. Jeffrey Farrington, 
Let's make it let's, happen, baby. Let's talk about it. Now, I, I am a little skeptical. I, I, I admire our friends, our colleagues over there in China. They got some giant, um, giant participation pools, huge research studies involving thousands and thousands of people. Skeptical sometimes of how accurate the data can be. There have been some reports in the past of Chinese data not necessarily being the most accurate. But if this is accurate, it's really uh, interesting information coming out of this big study here. So 30,000 patients were followed over the course of 10 years in myopia control, ortho-K, atropine, the various methods that are out there. Um, they studied, in particular, of those 30,000, they narrowed it down to 10,000 patients. I'm not sure how they made that cut, but these are the 10,000 right. they studied. And of those 10,000, 16 and a half percent of the patients they treated for myopia control demonstrated a shortening of axial length, not just a slowing of progression, not just a slowing of lengthening, but an actual shortening of axial length, which is remarkable to me. I would I would not expect that game to happen. Changing. Yeah, that's yeah. game changing. When I saw that 16%, uh, percent, I was just mind blown. And when I saw the shortening aspect, I was like, did I read that wrong? So I went back right. and read the article again, uh, because right. I've never seen any conversation or any dialogue or any articles that had that type of uh, conversation or um, uh, uh, feedback, right? So I'm curious to see where this is going to go. Um, they Me did too. have a lot of people that was a part of this. Um, so let's just see where that where that ends, man, because um, yeah. that, that can change the game for myopia control for sure. And and looking more closely at their data too, it's even, it's even more interesting than what I just said. So how much of an impact <laughs> is it? Not not huge. It's about 0 0.2 millimeters was the, uh, the median shortening of axial length. But here's the interesting part. Um, it said age is a big predictor of how, how much of an impact the shortening effect has. I thought they meant yeah. younger age, but it's actually the opposite. Um, right. If they start ortho-K at six years old, there's a 2% chance of seeing shortening of axial length. When they started it at 18 years old, there was a 50% chance of shortening of axial length. The older patients were more likely to have a shortening response, which is crazy to me. If that's if that's true, that's that's huge. Well, well, let's let's break this down, right? So maybe there's an opportunity to really have this hybrid approach of myopia control. We know yeah. with my site um, that that lens the studies. It's for I can't recall the age group, but let's just say you know seven to fifteen, right? Maybe when you get to that outer part, then maybe you pivot that myopia control yeah. to this ortho K, and that could continue to help to reduce potential myopia complications down the road, right? So maybe yeah. we should start thinking there are different steps for myopia control, different stages, different ages that we actually implement these different uh, techniques, right? I completely agree. Obviously, it's important to get them when they're young, but it's it's yeah. interesting to know that it maybe not might not be too late as they get older to have still a meaningful impact. So interesting, yeah. interesting yeah. data. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, next up, my friend, we have a topic that we love to call. It's time for back to the foreopter, where we bring you the latest action in the science of refraction. I love That's it. I right. love it. That's right. This next topic is when not to prescribe. And I know everyone out there is listening. What do you mean when not to prescribe? Have you lost your mind, Dr. Glover? Have you lost your mind, Dr. Fairley? Right. You guys yeah. are losing it. I don't know if I can listen to this show anymore. This <laughs> article was very interesting to me. So I'm ready to dive deep into it. Let's go. Me too. A recent article in the Review of Optometry by Drs. Schnell and Taub, two optometrists here in our in our lovely great country here. Just reminding us, I, I'm a big, big proponent of practical optometry. Let's treat our patients for the needs that they have and what they actually have to do to function. I'm a huge proponent of that. And this article is a reminder of that. It just goes into detail about what visual acuity do our kids need at various ages. As of course, we know when they're when kids are younger, they tend to be working more closely. The reading the material they're using is larger. The right. visual demands are less for a kindergartner than a, a 12 year, than a person in 12th grade, of course, because the reading material is so much uh, larger. Right. So, um, yeah, so the visual needs of a young kid are much uh, less. So for kindergarten, second grade level, the uh, the kids have a distance visual acuity need of about 2100 to 2300 from grades three to five. It approximates about 2060. And then it goes uh, down from there. Yeah. And so they had some case studies here demonstrating some of their recent uh, actions they took or, or didn't take. Uh, their first case study was a four-year-old, came in the uh, refractive error here was about um, minus two diopters of cylinder with uh, about plano minus two. And the kid was seeing about 2030 and they made the decision not to prescribe here in this case for the four-year-old, which I think is reasonable. The kid's got, you know, okay vision for his tasks. He's probably gonna need glasses later on. Is it worth it to put this four-year-old in a 
two adopters of sail glasses. Maybe not. I can see, I can be with them on that one. But their second case is one I might disagree with, Dr. Glover. Um, it was an eight-year-old who came in, and this eight-year-old had no complaints, was seeing about 2030 in either eye, refracted to about minus 75 adopters of sphere, and they also made the decision not to prescribe here. Yeah. For this case, I probably would have given this kid glasses. Maybe wouldn't have said that all the time wear is necessary, but I still would have given the kid glasses probably. But, yeah. you know, they make a good point. The kid has no complaints. He's seeing well enough for his demands. It's an interesting reminder. What do you think, Dr. Glover, about these, these cases? Yeah, so for the first case, me personally, I would have prescribed, right? Minus two, I just think, you know, accommodated, focusing, things of that nature. I'm going to give that patient the pair of glasses, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I just, I, I wouldn't sleep well at night not giving them those glasses, personally. For the second case, I definitely would give them the glasses. Yeah. And one thing I did see in this article as well is that they did educate the patient's parents about myopia control, mm -hmm. right? And I think they actually implemented that as well. But for both of the cases, I would actually prescribe. Now, let me ask you this. I want to push back to you. Um, being that that was with the rule, um, if it was against the rule, would you still have that same mindset of not prescribing for that case one? You know what? I would be... I would be much more likely to prescribe with against the rule. With the rule patients, not that I advocate squinting, but our with the rule <laughs> patients are, of course, champion squinters. You squint with that 180 astigmatism, it just goes away. And at four years old, I think that might be okay for him. But yeah, against the rule, I'm much more likely to prescribe. And you made a very good point, Dr. Glover. I do want to uh, correct myself. They did they did treat the eight-year-old patient with atropine. So they are beginning myopia control. So no glasses, but they did start myopia control with that patient. That's correct. Yeah. I mean, I, I think these are conversations that need to be had, right? Um, because everyone has a different way of prescribing, right? And I think the key thing is having the conversation and talking about best practices, but explaining why you're doing those things, right? Because we all practice differently and we may have more experience than others. And if we see something that works and we see something that makes a difference, then put me on the game. That way I could be a better clinician, a better optometrist, a better prescriber as well. So I love this article simply because it really is kind of the extreme on both ends, right? Um, but it was a fantastic find. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. I want to give I want to give big props to the authors as well for putting themselves out there and saying, "Hey, yeah. here are some things that I'm doing that may be against the grain." These are important conversations that I feel many optometrists are not willing to have. So props to them, and I, I'm with them. Thank you for for sharing the uh, for being out there, guys. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Mark uh, Taub, I believe that's how you pronounce it. He's a well-known name in eye care. So, you know, when he puts stuff out, I'm pretty sure he has the facts behind it, right? Yeah. So, again, to your point, uh, uh, we appreciate y'all having this conversation and having an open conversation so that we can think a little bit outside of the box. All right, my friend, what we got up next is Color Me Bad. Wasn't that a group or a song back in the day? I can't remember. It was Man, something. It, it sounds right. like one. It's, if yeah. it's not, we should start our own group here. Again. <laughs> yeah. 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 Ebony and Ivory cover. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so my, my wife sent me an Instagram post, as she does. As I'm, I'm an old man. I'm like, what are these these instant grams? How do I, how do I deal with it? Um, of a, of a, a Spanish guy undergoing a color-changing eye surgical procedure. So... Um, just a these are these are, sweeping, these are sweeping across social media right now. Lots of videos out there of these iris changing, uh, or rather eye color changing procedures. They've been around forever. So um, the the first procedure here is a keratopigmentation, where basically they are tattooing the cornea uh, to change the color of the eye. Now there are I want to be important uh, important distinction here. There are two different reasons why one might do this. One is because you have an injured eye, a damaged eye, right. an opaque eye where the cornea is already scarred or the visual potential of the eye is already gone and they are providing pigment to this eye either to um, prevent some huge glare sensitivity problems, to block out light that is annoying, or to just give the eye, a blind eye, a more aesthetically pleasing appearance. Now, I'm, I'm in favor of that. I can see why people would do that. I still think a contact lens might be a, a better choice here for these patients. Um, it's a great reminder of a great saying that I would learn in school. And all you have is a hammer. Everything looks like a nail, right? So these, these surgeons <laughs> see these patients like, oh, they got a problem. Let's do surgery. Well, maybe a contact lens would still be okay here. But at least for these patients where there is no visual potential or there's a big need, I can see that doing these kind of risky surgeries. But there are a lot of patients with healthy eyes that just don't like their eye color who are getting these like light blue iris, uh, light blue uh, dyes injected into their cornea for color changing purposes. And this is a big problem. Um, yeah. the, the risk here, I don't think is worth the potential aesthetic gain. 
Not and the all. American Academy of Ophthalmology just released a big uh, a warning last month uh, about these procedures, educating our patients uh, about why this is not a great idea. Yeah. I mean, and some of the complications of uh, the next topic you're going to touch on, the implant surgery, um, is, you know, it can really reduce vision, blindness, light sensitivity, elevated pressures inside the eye, which we know can lead to glaucoma and potentially blind the patient, cataracts, injury to the cornea, um, and also inflammation, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, with any of these procedures, the number one thing that pops to mind for me, especially the one that deals with the cornea in particular, are dry eyes, right? Absolutely. Um, I just think that that is going to cause a ton of trouble with dry eyes and potentially even some issues with um, being able to see clearly, you know, just yeah. the way the light rays hit the cornea. So, um, you know, these are things that we have to be educated about. We have to be able to have a conversation about. We have to have the facts and we have to have reliable resources to educate our patients about because patients will go on Instagram. They will go on TikTok. They will go on all these platforms and you have all these gurus out there talking and they have no clue what they're talking about. Right. So for anybody out there that may be a patient um, of mine or anyone else, get the facts, see your local optometrist, have that conversation. We don't give medical advice on the show. We're just putting some knowledge out there, but we always urge you to see your local optometrist anytime that you may experience any symptoms of any of these conversations that we may have, or if you're thinking about exploring any of these topics as well. That's right. Yeah. So just a quick recap to the two procedures. The first one that I talked about was the corneal tattooing, where they'll bathe the cornea in ink and then use either a needle or a laser to make small um, holes in the cornea for that ink to be soaked up. And the second one, they're actually making an incision into the cornea and implanting a little iris implant on top of the regular iris that has this just color pigmented on it. And that's that's just even crazier to me. I can't imagine the risks there of uh, angle closure and glaucoma and issues like that. I, it's, it's nuts to me. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Jeffrey, you got to give me love. You like the title, right? Color me bad. You get oh, of course. It? I love it. I love it. Come on now. That's great. Dr. Glover. I, I bring some articles here, but he brings the he brings the name game every time with these, these, these great names. Now, this next Thank one you. is not as innovative when, when it comes to the title, but myopia control glasses, right? Yep. Getting, Big we're, we're getting in the eye control. industry. Yeah. Fire away. Well, don't you worry. The, the, uh, the manufacturer here has come up with their own great uh, names for us to think about here. So they are using diffusion optics technology or DOTS to uh, provide myopia control in a lens on, on the eye. This is sight glass, another um, myopia control glasses that are out there. Um, and so just like myopia control contact lenses, we're talking peripheral diffusion optics, peripheral uh, blur optics to give us some, some myopia control effect. And these glasses, they have these, these small dots all throughout the uh, mid periphery and periphery of the lens that are providing some some contrast uh, diffusion to give the eye this uh, myopia control effect. And it's it's these lenses, you know, the when you see the glasses lenses that have these small lenticules or different different properties like that, they can look a little bit different. But these these look much more reasonable than some of the other ones that I've yeah. seen. Yeah. yeah, they're using a different slightly different technology here too. It's interesting to see these uh, these glasses. Have you had any any patients that use these glasses or similar glasses to these, Dr. Glover? No, I haven't had any that have walked through my doors. I know in Canada, they're doing a lot of myopia control with glasses, and there's a lot of different companies out there that have products. Um, but I'm excited to uh, get it into my practice whenever it comes, right? The one cool thing that I excuse me, love about this concept is that there are two brands that are innovative in this space, right? I mean, when you look at Cooper Companies, Cooper Vision, right? And then also you look at Estel Exotica, uh, innovation, technology, you combine two major companies and they create something like Sight Glass. So I'm super excited to have this in my practice simply because these are folks out there that have been innovative with, you know, my site with Cooper Vision. But then when you look at a company like Ethel Exotica and they come out with something like the Ray-Ban Meta Smart Glasses, which I'm wearing right now, that is a game changer. We need companies to take it to the next level and we need companies to partner to go to the next level. And that's what we're seeing right now. I think the future of optometry is great, man. We're going to see a lot of cool things uh, kick out in the next couple of years, my friend. Yeah, I love I love having these options in our back pocket, these other things that we can try. Yeah. yeah. So next up, we have another amazing article. And this one, I love the name. I know the love, that last one was a little dry, but I picked it back up. The next topic is... Da -da -da -da! Cosmic eyes. That's what right. Do you have? <laughs> as, as I was just telling you earlier, Dr. Glover, I'm all about practical optometry. So let's talk about the effect of astronauts and their eyes in outer space. 
These are things we see every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's an interesting topic, though. It's something that we need to be, as eye care professionals, we might have patients come in and ask these questions. And there's things, things to keep in mind. So what are the effects of long-duration space flight on the eye? Yeah. Um, it's an interesting topic. So uh, the uh, Space-Associated Neuroocular Syndrome, or SANS, is a, a documented phenomenon that occurs. The most common, uh, the closest analog on, in, on Earth here would be idiopathic intracranial hypertension, where you get papilledema, disc edema from pressure in the uh, in the brain getting a little bit too high. This happens quite frequently in astronauts. They'll, they'll come back to Earth. They'll have some disc edema. They'll have some choroidal folds. They'll have some hyperopic shift. Um, of, uh, of uh, there's a recent study done on seven astronauts. They had these really really thorough uh, eye exams prior to their trip on the ISS and then after coming back from the International Space Station, what effects did the trip have on their eyes? And there were some some pretty interesting effects. Um, so there were seven astronauts studied in this uh, in this study. Uh, of those seven, five returned with optic disc edema, five had some globe flattening, five wow. had nerve fiber layer infarcts, six had nerve fiber layer thickening, and six had a hyperopic shift between half and 1.75 diopters. These are significant changes. Wow, that's a huge yeah. change for the uh, hyperopic uh, shift there. It is. It is a big change. And these these changes are, uh, for the most part, reversible, which is good. But some of the hyperopic shifts did stay. And, you know, why is this a big, why does this matter? Well, we're gearing up for potentially a, a one-way trip to send people to Mars. And, you know, what's going to happen when they get there months later? Are they going to have ocular complications? Another great article that uh, just came out here, too, is talking about the risk of radiation-induced cataracts. This is something that, for whatever reason, I've been thinking about for years. We're going to send folks to Mars. They're going to land there. They're going to have posterior subcapsular cataracts. They're going to be blind. Come on. <laughs> so that is, that is a risk. That is a risk that's now being thankfully talked about. I can sleep at night again because people are thinking about these important things that are bothering me. Um, of course, uh, radiation-induced cataracts are most likely to cause posterior subcapsular cataracts, and you're getting all sorts of crazy radiation in space that you don't get on Earth. Cosmic particles are bouncing across the eye. It's a real risk that these healthy, healthy 20, 30-year-olds are going to land on Mars with posterior subcapsular cataracts. Should they go with cataract surgery done preventatively beforehand? It might not be a bad idea. Hey, you're bringing up a great point. And now this is another great point. You may have an astronaut that may walk into your practice, right? So now when we see these different changes, these different shifts um, in our practice, another question we got to ask, are you an astronaut? Have you That's been right. to space, right? right? Especially when they do start sending people, you know, I mean, people are going, you know, like we got to start thinking about these things and having these real conversations with our patients. So uh, yeah. fantastic call out, man. And here's another interesting thing too, making me feel bad about my, my equipment game in my office. They were talking about the need for doing fluorescein angiography on astronauts, how useful it would be to do it in space and saying, oh, we don't have the capability to do fluorescein angiography on astronauts in the ISS yet, but we do have a, an OCT on the ISS with fluorescein, you know, mimicking. They have an OCT on the ISS, my God. That's, That's wild, insane. Man. We're doing That's OCTs wild. on these astronauts in outer space. That's crazy, man. Yeah. yeah. That just shows that's truly the standard of what you should have in your practice now. Right, right. right. I mean, they got, they it got there, in space, me in our office. Come on, step your game up. Step your game right. up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, this has been fantastic. I appreciate you always taking the opportunity to sit down and have this conversation and bring the hottest topics, the latest trends, but most importantly, keep our colleagues educated. You got to remember, patients are going to come in and ask you these questions. You are the expert. You have the answers. So be knowledgeable and always tune in to I Care Shenanigans. It's your favorite optometrist, Dr. Daryl Glover, and my brother from another mother, Dr. Jeffrey Fardick. Stay healthy, stay positive and blessed. And until next time, peace. Thank you for listening to I Care Shenanigans. Big thanks from Drs. Daryl Glover, Jeff Fardink, and the whole team here at Defocus Media. Follow us on social media where our handle is Defocus Media on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Remember, even if you're not easy on the eyes, you can always take care of your vision. We'll see you next time.